Scientists say that our annual carbon dioxide emissions need to plunge by half by the year 2030 if we want to keep world warming within safish levels. But we emit way too much now to hit that target, and instead of plunging, emissions are still going up by 2.5% in the U.S. and way worse than that in China last year. In the last week of the old Congress, activists from something called the Sunrise Movement called for a total transition to renewables and a massive investment in new technology funded by the federal government. The so-called Green New Deal scored headlines, but the new House leadership nixed a select committee to plan it. And even within movement ranks, the reference to the New Deal gave some people pause. So what next? Is a more 21st century New Deal, New Green Deal possible? And if so, how to get there? And what does any of this have to do with the yellow vest protests that have been taking place in France? Joining us to discuss all of this, all of this and more, I have Elizabeth Yampier, co-chair of the Climate Justice Alliance, Varshini Prakash, co-founder of the Sunrise Movement, and Sean Sweeney of the School of Labor and Urban Studies here at the City University of New York. Varshini, let's come to you first. We were there on the ground. The Laura Flanders Show had reporters in Washington in November, and we caught you and some of your colleagues as you were protesting in the streets. Talk a little bit about the context for that November demonstration. Why did you pick the timing, and what were you set out? What, what were you setting out to accomplish? Sure. So this was exactly one week after young people had turned out in historic numbers in the midterm elections of 2018. Uh, we had been seeing articles all across um, the news cycle saying that Dems were damping down hopes on climate for the 116th Congress. And we saw Nancy Pelosi get on TV right after the Democrats took back the House and say that her answer to solving the climate crisis was to revive an ancient committee tasked with studying the issue and the impacts of the crisis. Just what we need. Another Just committee. what we need when UN climate scientists are literally telling us we have 12 years to make unprecedented changes to every part of our society and economy to stop the crisis. So naturally, um, hundreds of young people were pretty pissed off about this and decided to take action to ensure that climate change would remain would become a urgent political priority for Democrats in the new Congress. All right, so we were there, and this is some of what we saw. Uh, check it out. We don't have time for any more excuses. We need the real solutions to the climate crisis. Am I right? Yeah! We need the real solutions to the climate crisis as mandated by science and justice. And that means a rapid wartime economic mobilization to transition our economy and our society over the next 12 years to stop the climate crisis, starting now, starting now, not starting in 10 years. Sunrise is a movement of young people fighting to stop climate change and create millions of good jobs in the process. We will be visiting around 50 different members of Congress to ask them to support Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's proposal for a select committee on a Green New Deal. Uh, and we will be visiting three key offices of Democrats in the House who hold a lot of power and asking them especially to support the proposal. Okay, so that's the room number. It started out as a very small group of people who came together and wanted to do this and has slowly over the past two years grown and just a month ago, we were in the same building asking for the same thing. Mm -hmm. And in that month, we have grown by the hundreds, by the thousands around the country. And we're back to demand a Green New Deal. Last year, Hurricane Irma hit my hometown. And it was the first time in my memory that we were given evacuation orders. And my grandparents couldn't evacuate because they were both in wheelchairs. That's when I knew I had, like, this is something I had to actively fight for. So a Green New Deal would give my state uh, hope for any sort of a future. Green jobs can't lose! Clear eyes, full hearts! Green jobs can't lose! The UN released a terrifying but illuminating report that says that we have 12 years for a rapid wartime-esque economic mobilization to transition every part of society to stop the climate crisis. 
in that they call for a transition to a 100% renewable energy economy. Um, they're calling for massive investment in the front lines of poverty and pollution to ensure that the people who are hit first and worst by the climate crisis are not left behind and massive investment in jobs and infrastructure uh, to stop the climate crisis. So all of those things are included in Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's select committee for a Green New Deal. of young people fighting to stop climate change. Young folks have waited for our whole lives, for decades, for leadership to put forward policy that would save our futures, um, and it has not happened. And over the past three weeks, we have heard excuse after excuse for why our Democratic leaders can't support this committee. We've heard it's not the right committee. It's not the right time. We don't know enough about it. That is no excuse for jeopardizing my generation, our generation's future, and the lives of our children, and our children's children, and our children's children's children. This is your second warning. If you do not wish to be arrested, this is your second warning. Over 100 young people risked and then were arrested uh, following the sit-in that we had at Rep Pelosi, Rep Hoyer, and um, Rep uh, McGovern's offices today, some of the highest ranking Democratic leaders in the party. Um, there are a, thou uh, a thousand other young people who are here who are rallying in support and will continue the effort to organize not just in D.C., but in our communities and our contexts at home to bring a Green New Deal and push federal, federal policymakers who are accountable to us to back this. By the time those 12 years that scientists have given us to transition the economy are up, many of our members will be 30 years old and our lives and our futures will be condemned forever. The next step is uh, all throughout 2019, we're gonna be making the, uh, building the political consensus and the public support uh, that will in 2021 and beyond make a Green New Deal a political inevitability. So, Vashni, congratulations. We should say that while you're talking about global warming, it was a very cold day, hence the jumping up <laughs> and down. Um, what's happened since? Well, there has been so much energy and activism. We've seen thousands and thousands of young people who have come out of the woodwork, who are excited about a plan that actually goes to the scale and scope of the crisis that is talking about centering racial and economic justice that builds upon the work that the Climate Justice Alliance and so many other groups have done um, for decades. And we've seen hundreds of people visiting uh, congressional offices to ask them to back a Green New Deal. We've seen thousands of articles written about this. Um, but and Pelosi and all those high-powered Dems whose offices you sat in on? Yeah, but unfortunately, Again, the Democratic establishment didn't take the opportunity that we put in front of them. We were utterly disappointed when Nancy Pelosi and Democratic leaders did not actually embrace the select committee for a Green New Deal and instead created a select committee for the climate crisis that has no subpoena power, that doesn't include a mandate to actually draft a plan for a Green New Deal, <clears throat> and uh, it allows people taking money from fossil fuel executives mm -hmm. to sit on. So, so welcome to our reality, right? I mean, Elizabeth, your reactions to seeing this, to seeing the coverage. Um, great, all these new people out of the woodwork. You've been out of that woodwork for a while. Right. Well, it was mixed. It was, oh, this is really exciting. Um, people have finally discovered that we're in the middle of a crisis and that we have to respond in a big way. Um, then it was, okay, what is this? And what does this mean for frontline communities? and um, how are decisions being made? And, um, you know, there's a basic tenet of, of environmental justice that we speak for ourselves, that people of color and frontline communities speak for ourselves. And the idea of, uh, of something being created without uh, frontline communities developing it or creating it or putting in its recommendations was pretty kind of old school. And so, um, 
but we didn't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I know it's a terrible thing to say, but we didn't want to do that. We wanted to see what's the possibility, what's happening here, and how can we shape it moving forward. So what did you do? And so what we did was we uh, consulted with our 68 groups throughout the country and our networks and alliances. We asked them if they had heard about it, most hadn't. Um, we put together a platform that came from this consultative consultative process. Uh, we shared that with uh, Alexandria Ocasio uh, Coltes, and then we set up a meeting with her. And I think the meeting this went really well. This is the congresswoman well. from New York, yeah. who she's is from the New York, ever she's Puerto Rican, and got very involved in this. And she's from an EJ community. <coughs> and so we believed that she would understand us, uh, but not just hear us, but feel us, yeah. that she, she understands that this is where we're all coming from. And that we have always been about solutions and that solutions are local and that we have been operationalizing those solutions for a really long time. So she but met with you all in the, her office? We did, just, just, I think it was last week. <laughs> and this morning I had the distinct honor of meeting with representatives from frontline communities and the Climate Justice Alliance to figure out how we can bring uh, Kentucky, how we can bring Native tribes, how we can bring the South Bronx and the direct communities impacted into the space of leadership so that they can draft and lead a Green New Deal for the United States. I can't tell you how important and how much of a privilege and an honor it is to meet with the folks on the ground doing the work and being able to uplift their ideas to put them in a position of leadership. Uh, we need to be able to trust that communities can govern themselves and I'm so excited to have heard and and uplift uh, those solutions. So thank you all so much. <laughs> Who's power? Our power. Who's power? Our power. So we brought in uh, Tom Goldtooth from the Indigenous Environmental Network. Uh, we brought in folks from Portland, uh, folks from um, from Kentucky, from people who are doing work on mountaintop removal, who are trying to transition away from an extractive economy. Um, I was representing both CJ and my organization, which as you know, just launched the first community owned uh, solar cooperative in the state of New York. So those are examples mm. of the things that we're doing in West Virginia, in, in Brooklyn, in Detroit, in all, right, so all over. So moving to you, Sean, this is all happening while something kind of interesting is happening on the international front, specifically in France with these yellow vest protests. How do you see the connection if there is one? I think there's a strong connection. Um, first and foremost, people are rising up for different reasons. But those, once they are in motion, they see the connections between many issues. I mean, Climate. if you only had read the New York Times about the Yellow Vest protest, you would think this is working class white people against a well-intentioned environmental measure, a carbon tax. Yes, well, those people on those demonstrations are far more intelligent than that. They know that a uh, a uh, charge on gasoline or diesel is not going to do anything to improve the uh, climate crisis, that we do need radical measures. They were saying, we'll be happy to give up our cars, but we need trains, well, we need exactly. infrastructure. We're talking about many people living in rural areas that have had their railways privatized, their buses privatized. Macron is leading the privatization push in France of public transport. So here we have a situation they can see through the hypocrisy and the contradictions of boutique environmentalism that only pleases the mm. investors. And this is a fundamental rebellion against the market and the idea that we have to turn the green transition into something that people are going to make a load of money from. So I think what Elizabeth said, said earlier is absolutely right on target. This has got to come from the people. So is there a, a we now? I mean, is this, is this a we at, at the table here, Elizabeth? I think we're working on building the, the, the bigger we. Um, and, and what that means is we have to find alignment. There was some language um, in the Green New Deal that was concerning, like carbon sequestration, carbon capture. There were uh, concepts that were really contrary to how we think we need to move away from fossil fuel extraction. And I think that we're working on, we need to build the bigger we. We I mean, have to be doing even that. Even the New Deal frame, it has different resonances for different people. So I know a lot of folks uh, who have a warm feeling about FDR and you know the last big federal investment, direct investment in a jobs program, um, the New Deal, mm -hmm. uh, stopped a depression in the light of a war. Uh, but there are a lot of other people who say, wait a minute, didn't cover farm workers, didn't cover domestic workers, mm -hmm. didn't cover people who work for tips. A whole lot of people, disproportionately people of color, disproportionately women of color, got written out. So why are we talking new deals? 
Absolutely, and I think that's a history that we have to understand in order to make something much better in this moment. Um, it is, to me, if, if this transition towards a better economy and society doesn't include and doesn't go through racial increasing racial equity and wealth um, and, and obliterating wealth inequality, it is not a Green New Deal. Um, I think we have a history in this country of treating people cruelly and differently because of the color of our skin and of po a, a political elite class that is all too tolerant of um, rampant wealth inequality both domestically and globally, and that's led to um, communities of color bearing the brunt of both disaster, yeah. but also of pollution and extraction. Those frontline communities you're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have some work to do knitting things together. Let's take a listen to some of what is being said in France, because we get remarkably little coverage of it here. We're trying to supplement on this program. Um, here's a quick clip from, from Real News. Uh, check this out, and we'll discuss it. L'identité politique des Gilets jaunes s'est déplacée de plus en plus vers la gauche, en fait. Et beaucoup de personnalités de droite qui, au départ en France, de droite populiste, d'extrême droite populiste, qui avaient soutenu ce mouvement, s'en sont détachées progressivement en voyant que ce mouvement prenait une identité qui était une identité de gauche. Au début, le mouvement des Gilets jaunes, c'était un mouvement qui n'avait pas d'identité politique claire. C'était un mouvement qui parlait de précarité, de violence sociale, de violence politique, de la violence du gouvernement d'Emmanuel Macron. Et moi, je vois que dans le mouvement, on le voit tous ici, que les revendications euh, ou les mots qu'on pouvait entendre euh, au départ, euh, les mots racistes, euh, les mots euh, homophobes, moi je suis gay, euh, tout ce vocabulaire-là euh, a disparu euh, de plus en plus aujourd'hui. Bien sûr qu'il en reste encore, euh, mais euh, euh, l'importance et l'importance de la présence du comité Adama aussi ici, c'est de euh, se battre pour la signification de ce mouvement et pour lui donner un langage euh, progressiste de gauche et euh, anti-violence policière. Ah, anti, anti -capitaliste ah, anti il va y avoir de la couleur, toutes les couleurs. Il y a le collectif Adama qui appelle contre les violences policières. Et il y a tous ceux et toutes celles qui n'en peuvent plus de vivre dans une misère totale dans les quartiers populaires, là où on cache les services publics. Parce que là où il y a les plus grands dégâts du néolibéralisme, les dégâts les plus importants du néolibéralisme, c'est d'abord et avant tout dans les quartiers populaires et dans les zones rurales. On n'en peut plus de l'augmentation du gasoil, mais de manière très générale, de la case des écoles, de la case des hôpitaux, de la case de tous les services publics. Là, l'enjeu maintenant, c'est de répartir les richesses, de rétablir l'ISF. C'est ça l'enjeu. Un service public, un réel service public qu'on avait avant, qu'on n'a plus aujourd'hui. Donc un service public de l'énergie pour les usagers, avec un statut de haut niveau pour les salariés de l'énergie et au service de, de la nation. Avec un pouvoir de décision par les usagers et donc pour un, un meilleur euh, rendu. Bah, comment on se positionne Après, euh, nous on est à tout. Hein. Il y a des discussions il faut en avoir, bien évidemment. On est, on est pour évoluer. Nous, le souci principal, c'est effectivement l'avenir de la planète. C'est bien évidemment c'est indispensable. Après, on ne peut pas radicalement tout changer du jour au lendemain. Il faut, il faut, il faut avancer euh, avec le, tout en respectant la planète, bien évidemment. Donc après, euh, l'éducation aussi, les travers de l'énergie, elle doit se faire, bien évidemment. On a essayé d'organiser aujourd'hui avec le comité euh, Adama euh, et euh, le comité des cheminots de l'Intergare. C'est un comité, en fait, un collectif de cheminots euh, intersyndical hein, avec euh, des syndiqués et des non-syndiqués. Ah, on a participé à trois mois de lutte qui étaient importantes. Ah, C'était intense. Et on va dire que même s'il si, même y a eu une défaite euh, des cheminots après ces trois mois, parce que la réforme, elle est passée, cette réforme, quand même... Euh, elle apporte un cumul en fait de colère, de cette colère sociale qui existe en tout cas, euh, cas aujourd'hui. C'est un autre visage, c'est un visage de plus et un visage qui vient en plus avec des revendications politiques. Par exemple, il y a les étudiants étrangers qui aujourd'hui aussi se manifestent et sont mécontents particulièrement parce que les étudiants étrangers 
On leur a multiplié par 16, 17 les droits d'inscription parce qu'ils sont étrangers. Autrement dit, il y a aujourd'hui des mécontentements qui se rejoignent. Mais qu'on s'entende bien. All right, so criticism, self-criticism, I think that they're more kind of lime greeny kind of vests. Um, but that's what we're talking about. The yellow vest movement in France clearly is going through some of the same um, discussions that we're having here. I, don't, I wasn't there until we have a much bigger field reporting budget. I can't tell you much about what we just saw, but it was shot in early December. And it clearly shows union workers from the energy sector and others um, talking at least about how do we um, reframe and maybe reconstitute some of the, the, the movement that's taking place there. Elizabeth, thoughts looking at that. And are you connected? Is the Climate Justice Alliance connected with what's happening in other countries? We are. Um, you know, we always talk about the, the global south and the fact that people who live in the global south are the ones being impacted um, by decisions made by corporations and by, you know, the United States. Um, so we are connected. Um, our members go to Brazil, they go to Honduras, um, they go to different parts of Latin America and, and other parts of the world uh, to build alliances. Um, we have similar challenges everywhere where you've got folks that don't want to center racial justice in a, in a climate conversation. Uh, we've got unions that are thinking about jobs but aren't thinking about um, you know, fossil fuel extraction at, 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 and, and what that means and what that process looks like. Um, and so I think that um, it makes it impossible to move as quickly as we'd like to mm -hmm. uh, because people really, their process, their way of working uh, with each other is very capitalist. It's very extractive and competitive. It's not about co it's not about collaborations. So, Sean, let me bring you back in. I mean, I can't help thinking back to the 30s again. I mean, right. for all of my criticisms of the New Deal, this was a compromise that capitalism made um, in face of demand and the scary prospect to them of a sort of socialist rise in Europe and in the United States. Can we get beyond, I mean, how do we get beyond, or is the agenda to get beyond kind of pleading with the Pelosi's of the world to amassing that kind of power? And is that a relevant model for 21st century USA? I think there are many parts of that model that is indeed relevant. First and foremost, yes, it was an emergency response. Um, but look what happened, it changed the paradigm. But, and in the way that, for example, the Rural Electrification Administration, something I'm particularly fond of, did it do everything right? No, it didn't. But only 10% of rural homes had electricity in 1935, and it became almost 100% within an 18, 19 year period. It was the government acting, yes, to sustain its own system perhaps, um, but it suspended markets. It basically said, these people can't afford to pay for electricity, but we're going to provide electricity anyway. But acting because they were afraid. There was That's a push right. coming to them there from the left. Is there that kind of thing today, Varshini? Oh, absolutely. And I think part of what we are doing at Sunrise is being a part of a battle for the heart and soul of the Democratic Party. I think that is what Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is a part of. A lot of these incredible young women of color who are changing the face of the Democratic Party are actually fighting for it to be a party that works for all working people. I, I was just going to say that we are working locally, regionally, and statewide because the Democratic Party has often failed us. And so we don't want to put all our eggs in one basket, regardless of what governance, climate change is going to disrupt governance. So we have to incorporate um, and operationalize just transitions on the ground. And we hope that this is a just Green New Deal that funds and makes it possible for us to amplify the work that we've been doing for generations and, and for years. Um, because right now, it is really difficult for people of color to even trust the democratic mm -hmm. uh, system in the way that it's, it's basically played our communities. John? I see everybody is becoming engaged in a new way. 
Let's look at some of the progressive unions. We talk a lot about the more conservative and cautious unions. The progressive unions in nursing, healthcare, public transport, postal Teaching. services, they are pushing hard for this new public narrative, connecting the dots. And I think this has global significance. They're, we're at a breakthrough moment, like you can see it, not just in the United States, but around the world. Yes, there are right-wing movements, but there are also a thinking, new left, pro-public, pro-ecology, pro-health narrative that's mm. emerging across these movements. So if the, the fires and the waters and the uh, famines are going to break through, power needs to too. All right. Thank you all. Really fantastic sort of conversation. I appreciate it. Sean uh, Sweeney, Elizabeth Yampierre, and Varshini Prakash, thank you so much. You can find more of our coverage of this issue and the Climate Justice Alliance and its allies at our website. That is lauraflanders.org.